very good Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ruzbe Parsi. I'm head of the Middle East and North Africa program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. And I will be moderating today's webinar, the third in our installment on Israel and Palestine. And this webinar will be about the situation in the Palestinian territories. We're calling it Gaza and the West Bank, how to unite one people. And for this webinar, we have four excellent experts who are going to help us understand and delve into some of the more intricate issues facing the Palestinian people beyond the headlines, as it were. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction of who they are. First, Dr. Yara Hawari, who is the senior analyst at Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Who has a, she has a PhD in Middle East politics from the University of Exeter. Uh, where she's also taught. Uh, welcome. Then we have uh, Dr. Marwa Fatafta, who is a Palestinian writer, researcher, and policy analyst based in Berlin. She leads Access Now's work on digital rights in the Middle East and North Africa as a MENA policy manager. You also have two MAs, one from Syracuse and another one from Duisburg Essen in Germany. Welcome. And Mohammed Shahada who is a Palestinian writer and activist from Gaza and currently the Europe's regional manager at the Euromed Human Rights Monitor. Welcome. And last but not least, Dr. Anders Persson, Passion, who is a lecturer at the Department of Political Science at Linnea University here in Sweden. And his primary research has been on the European Union in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And we will be getting back to that dimension uh, of this issue. Welcome. Glad to have all of you with us from the West Bank, from Berlin, from south of Sweden to north of Stockholm. Um, first, in order to kind of uh, set the table a bit in terms of what we're going to be discussing, I've asked Yara to give us a, a rundown, please. Thank you, and thank you so much for that introduction and, and for putting this, this panel together. I think I'd, I'd like to start by being a bit of a party pooper and problematizing the, the talk, the title of this talk and its description. Uh, the title, as mentioned, is Gaza and the West Bank, How to Unite One People. Um, and the description goes on to describe Palestinian society as divided between the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip. This isn't true. The, the Palestinian populations in Gaza and the West Bank represent uh, just over a third of the Palestinian um, population with five million people. Now, a further 2 million Palestinians are citizens of Israel living in historic Palestine. And these are the descendants of those who were exiled, who were not exiled in 1948 during the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And then we have 7 million Palestinians in exile, either in refugee camps in neighboring countries or elsewhere. So I think the title and the description are a bit misleading um, and actually contribute to, to a narrative which erases nearly two thirds of the Palestinian people. Uh, and some of us would actually call that epistemic violence. And I'm going to continue to be a party pooper here and also um, um, ask something about something else that was written in the description, which uh, described the two state project as a faded dream for young generations of Palestinians. And I would also argue that this is not accurate. You know, when we're talking about young generations, we're talking about those who grew up in the shadow of the Oslo Accords, Gilles Oslo, the, the Oslo generation, uh, and those who were born after it. Uh, and I would not say that the two-state project was their dream. It was imposed on them. Uh, and indeed, for many of them, their dream is simply to have fundamental rights and, and to live, you know, normal lives. And, and I think I want to dwell a little bit here on this concept of normal life. Uh, so much of the discourse now during the pandemic centers around this desire to return to normal. Now for Palestinians and so many other oppressed communities around the world, normality is an unjust, unequal and oppressive reality. And I think 2020 highlighted this more than ever. Now, of course, with the, the onset of the pandemic in Palestine and particularly in the West Bank and Gaza, there were massive fears uh, because of the state of the, the Palestinian healthcare system. And whilst world over the, the healthcare systems uh, have been struggling to cope, the Palestinian one was and, and is having to face the pandemic within a macro context of settler colonialism and in the West Bank and Gaza, more micro context of military occupation. 
Now, this manifests itself in, in military raids on medical facilities, the, the deliberate destruction of those facilities, the restricting of medical supplies um, to these territories by the Israeli regime. And not to mention this consistent process of de-development, which has resulted in a totally inadequate and donor-dependent system. Uh, and we also saw and continue to see during this period um, really insidious attempts by the Israeli regime to block Palestinian attempts at confronting the virus um, from the destruction of COVID-19 clinics and in Hebron, in the Jordan Valley, the arrest of volunteers in East Jerusalem attempting to distribute food and supplies to impoverished communities. And not to mention the, the consistent and systematic destruction of Palestinian homes by the Israeli army, which really you know, re renders the, the pandemic motto, stay at home, very cruelly ironic. Now, I realize um, we're, we're going to be talking more about internal pa Palestinian dynamics and the Israeli regime's suppression of the Palestinian people. But I do think it's crucial to set that context because Palestinian politics do not exist in a vacuum. They are affected by the Israeli regime's domination um, uh, and settler colonial regime. This year, we saw even more than before, total Palestinian leadership incompetence in the face of aggressive Israeli and US uh, foreign policy. Now, at the start of the year, I don't need to remind you all what happened, but we had this pomp and ceremony around the Trump administration's vision for peace, prosperity, and a brighter future for Israel and the Palestinian people, um, what was being called or dubbed as the, the deal of the century. Now, the clue really was in the title. You know, There was no mention of a Palestinian state. Um, and of course, this notion of prosperity really translates to offering the Palestinian leadership economic incentives um, in exchange for their fundamental rights. Now, I think the, the content of the vision itself was not particularly shocking. It didn't radically break from what has been previously presented to Palestinians as possible futures. Rather, I think it follows this traditional format of peace proposals over the past decades in which Palestinian futures are not at all premised on fundamental rights and Palestinian aspirations of sovereignty are completely disregarded. Then we saw a few months later, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's coalition government threatened to pass uh, legislation that would enable de jure annexation of large swaths of land in the Palestinian West Bank on July the 1st. Um, and a lot, in, a lot of people in the international community, poli policymakers, politicians, um, especially EU states reacted to this with statements of concern and condemnation. Um, but really, Western policymakers and, and Arab regimes, for that matter, have very little to say about de facto, about the de facto reality of annexation, which um, has always existed in the West Bank since its occupation by the Israeli regime. Now, for its part, the, the Palestinian Authority claimed to end all agreements with Israel. Um, including the security coordination. But in reality, what we saw was that this was really just rhetoric. Um, we saw a, a sort of a scaling down of some of that security coordination, um, but it, it really did continue in, in, in many areas. And, and I would say this year in general, the PA strategy seemed to be to hope and pray for a Biden win, um, which they did eventually get. Um, but I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a win for the Palestinian people. The Palestinian Authority now has no motivation to engage in um, reconciliatory talks with Hamas or to engage in any type of election process. You know, money will flow back into Ramallah and this old failed framework of the peace process will be revived. So what we have today um, really is a Palestinian leadership in both the West Bank and Gaza that is undemocratic, unrepresentative and increasingly authoritarian. Um, and this is not something that can be solved by elections, um, uh, much to the dismay of the European Union. You know, elections does not a democracy make. Democracies are expected to promote democratic practice, including uh, political plurality, not only in governmental institutions, but really in all areas of society. And this is an important point because many make the, the, the dangerous assumption, particularly in the West Bank and Gaza, that elections are interchangeable with democracy. And this is not the case. Elections really are a technical practice or a procedure um, that, that may well be a part of uh, or a product of a meaningful democratic process and culture, um, uh, but they also may, might be part of a society 
in which there isn't a democracy or democratic characteristics are lacking or absent. And indeed, uh, this is why democratic elections have to be part of a larger package uh, in which democratic accountability exists across society and where political plurality is accepted and encouraged. And in both the West Bank and Gaza, unfortunately, we see two authorities operating increasingly as authoritarian police states. Um, of course, in the context of an increasingly miniaturized Israeli settler colonial regime. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Perhaps we can sort of delve into some more points in the, in the discussion period. Thank you very much, Yara. Uh, yes, there is a lot there to get back to, both in terms of how things are framed and, and the substance of the matter. But uh, insisting on that we are, at this stage at least, primarily talking about the people who live in the occupied territories and the semi-occupied territories, if you will. Um, what about the division between Gaza and the West Bank? Because obviously what we're talking about are, in a sense, two microcosms. We're talking about two political entities neither of which is particularly popular uh, or particularly not corrupt or particularly elected, if that were to at least be one source of legitimacy one way or another. Um, so, but are they also then moving along two different trajectories in terms of the basic frames that they have at their disposal in terms of economic development, in terms of insight from the outside, as in accountability and so on? Marva, would that be something that you would like to address? Um, yes, of course. Uh, thank you so much for hosting uh, this interesting discussion. And thank you so much, Yoda, for this introduction. And, and I think it sets the scene quite perfectly from my perspective. I think it's important, building on, what, on Yoda's argument, when we talk about the division between the West Bank and Gaza, it's important to highlight that it's a political division. It's about two political factions. It's the most dominant political factions in the occupied Palestinian territories, Fatah in the West Bank, Hamas in Gaza. So it's not about the people. It's about these two factions that are in power. Now, that being said, I want to go back um, a little bit in history to understand what's at the root of this division. When did it start? And I, the, the, the main turning point here was the legislative elections uh, in 2006. And the fact that Hamas has won uh, a majority of seats in the Palestinian parliament, um, a result that Fatah, of course, who had monopolized power for years since the start of the, of the Palestinian Authority, didn't like. And the international community also uh, equally rejected. The international community's response, even though international observers of the election said that the elections were fair and, and free, they went ahead to say, to, Ham to condition Hamas, that they have to give up, denounce violence, they have to recognize Israel uh, in order for uh, the money, the foreign aid to continue to the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinians who make up a majority of the, Pal the, the Palestinian Authority uh, body as in, and as in forms of employees and part of security agencies and so on, have been deprived of their basic salaries for months. The international community has driven Palestinians into desperate, into desperate measures. I was in my early 20s, my uncle was a, was a teacher um, at the public schools in Palestine, and I do remember the discussions around how people were trying to find resources to, to be able to feed their families and put food on the table. So there is a grievance, I think, that had driven uh, Hamas, to, and I'm not here justifying Hamas or, or Fatah, I'm not taking side sidelines, I'm not particularly a uh, fan of either, but it is important to note how foreign powers also had intervened in the, in the, the spark, let's say, of the political division between uh, Hamas and Fatah. Um, now, it is also a second important point to note is that the, let's say the geographical and political fragmentation of the Palestinian people living in the occupied territories, because um, I wanna undermine, um, no, not undermine, sorry, uh, underline the, fa the fact that Yara mentioned in her introduction that when we talk about the Palestinian people, they're not only the Palestinians living in, in the occupied territories. We're a bigger polity than that. Uh, but for those who 
for those of us who are living in, in the occupied territories, we are fragmented, not because we wish to do so, but because Israel had forced um, us to, to, according to their ID, different ID tier system, where you have Palestinians living in the West Bank, Palestinians that are res residents of Israel living in East Jerusalem, Palestinians, uh, citizens of Israel who live in um, Israel, and then Palestinians who live under military blockade in Gaza. And there are many heartbreaking stories of Palestinian families where each uh, t a family member has a different ID and can't be reunited. So that's important also that this fragmentation is, is not a choice, it's not a Palestinian choice. And even if we try in this discussion uh, today to kind of dissect um, the realities from an intellectual perspective of, you know, the Palestinian polity and the socioeconomic situation in the West Bank and Gaza and, and how that plays into the division. It's really hard to ignore or um, the big elephant in the room and, and, the, and the basic backdrop of all of this, that is the Israeli occupation and, and the settler colonial project. It's even if, uh, and I actually, it is, um, amazing how Palestinians uh, had managed over generations and many attempts at erasure to still keep an intact Palestinian identity and share a same vision for freedom, justice, um, and, uh, and self-determination. We might have different opinions about how to achieve that, uh, there might be Palestinians that um, fall on different ideological lines, but the vision or the aspirations is the same. That is to, to live in dignity and in justice and, and freedom. Very good. Um, Mohammed, would you like to chip in? Thank you so much. I think there is a lot to unpack here, but um, to start with the most recent point, I think the Trump administration, regardless of how brutal and criminal it's been towards the, the Palestinians and the conflict in general, the process, um, call it a peace process, regardless of that, it's been a catalyst to bring Hamas and Fatah together. Uh, but as soon as Biden won the election, that paradigm collapsed. So it, it's worth going into the internal dynamics of why it was a catalyst and why it collapsed. And the reason that it became a catalyst for um, a unity, nominal unity, you can say minimal unity, because when they met Fatah and Hamas, they decided to leave all the disputes between them aside when they met in Beirut and said, let's focus on countering annexation, the, the Trump administration and the um, Israeli Arab premature normalization. Um, the motivation for that is clear. It's frustration, anger, as on the one hand of these developments, fear that it might get worse. For instance, for Fatah, uh, they were afraid that Trump and the Trump administration and Netanyahu might try to uh, overthrow Abbas and replace him with another substitute who would interact more positively with the developments in the region. So frustration, anger, outrage, fear, and despair. They didn't have any other choices. They burned old bridges. They exhausted their political capital uh, internationally, regionally, and even domestically. Uh, if you look at the population's trust towards the leadership, it, it eroded to a vast extent. So in that sense, as soon as Biden won, that sort of frustration, anger, the problem with it is that it's not as motivating as opportunities, not as motivating as hope. It burns quickly. You need a daily or occasional reminder of why you should get angry, why you should get mad. And these reminders are often taking the form of spectacular instances of violence, either in the case of Israel killing a civilian in the street or annexation uh, inching closer or another Arab country normalizing relations with Israel. So these spectacular instances are what sparks rage and anger amongst the leadership, but they burn quickly. And the underlying problem is that the occupation by the end of the day is not about spectacular instances of violence. It's about a latent, bureaucratic, heavily normalized, slow and gradual and incremental process of slow violence that, that's very uh, routinely to the extent that it, it's not viewed as violence at all. 
it's the microaggressions and the checkpoints, it's the, the economic besiegement, etc. So in that sense, the motivation burns quickly. Um, what happens after that is the lack of um, electoral incentive. That as long as the leadership is not is not uh, uh, prone to being held accountable through the ballot, they don't have any incentive to care for what people think. So the lack of electoral incentive, it's, it's the main reason, in my opinion, why the leadership, the current leadership on both sides of the aisle, only think about the most minimal, most symbolic steps to take to counter any threats that face the Palestinian population. Beyond that, there is not a strategic uh, focus on how to advance the Palestinian struggle, how to move it forward. There is more or less um, a contentment with the current status quo as it is, let's say, as a moment of respite until the circumstances improve and then we try to move ahead in one direction or another. And the reasons, of course, are clear for the Palestinian Authority. They, they've reached a corner where they are heavily trapped with their need for um, international community financing, with their need for their tax revenues from Israel, that they couldn't uh, challenge that apparatus one way or another. So the international community abandoned them when they tried to renegotiate the Paris Agreement with Israel. So for the Palestinian Authority, the status quo is the best they can hope for at the moment, that things just don't get worse. And for Hamas, any violent actions they undertake as armed resistance against Israel may bring an immediate disproportionate retaliation that takes Gaza into a fourth war that neither side wants. So in that sense, it, like, if you look at the Biden administration, it's far from being anything close to what the Palestinian Authority is hoping for. Biden, he's very much um, for Israeli Arab normalization. He will vehemently oppose the Palestinian authorities bid at the International Criminal Court against Israel, because he, his administration would think that this is the delegitimization of Israel's existence, not trying to hold it to account. And there are many other um, aspects and policies that the Palestinian Authority would be frustrated by the Biden administration. But at the same time, with Biden resuming or potentially resuming financing to the PA and UNRWA, it gives them the perfect pretext just to sit down and do nothing. And that's why, in my opinion, restoring the electoral incentive is the, the gateway to getting thing, things moving. Um, there are a lot of things that one can hope for, for instance, to start with genuine reconciliation. There are a lot of factors impeding that. It's, it's highly unlikely. Uh, there are many other options, reforming the PLO, reforming the Palestinian institutions and structures. But the most um, immediate option that is right in front of everybody's eyes is elections. As let's say it would be akin to a national referendum on who's most deserving of leading the Palestinian struggle and in what direction. And that I think is the worst nightmare for the current leadership is having to look their constituents in the eyes once again, 14 years after the last elections and account for this lost decade or more. And the, the issue of that is that with elections, it would be the only uh, opportune moment. There are a lot of risks involved, but I think the opportunities, personally, I think that they outweigh the risk. So it would be the, that I would conclude with is that elections would be the only um, window of opportunity for younger Palestinians to mobilize outside the traditional Fatah Hamas block any Palestinian youth movement in Gaza or the West Bank, one can easily anticipate as long as they amass influence, as long as they exert their influence, as long as they start moving the street, it's immediately crushed. But in elections, Hamas stipulated in its letter of approval in 2019 that the PA should respect the right to freedom of expression and assembly in the West Bank in order to go ahead with elections. And that is extraordinary because Hamas would have to reciprocate which would be the only window of opportunity for younger generations to mobilize. Thank you. Okay, so obviously we can we can have a discussion about elections. As Yara pointed out, they're not of a magical wand, but at the same time, it's also a question of whatever legitimacy you can gain and accountability 
Uh, of course, accountability requires more than one election. Otherwise, you can't vote out the people that, that uh, fail in their office, so to speak. But Anders, let's, uh, let's delve a bit more into this, because even if there were to be elections tomorrow, would it be incorrect to state that the two parties or whatever you want to call them, the two organizations are the ones who have electoral platforms in the sense of organization to be able to mobilize whoever they think they can entice as voters. So it's not just having a ballot in itself doesn't mean that anyone else stands a chance uh, unless they can mobilize and build a, an organization that allows them to canvas votes. Anders, so the, this divide, and again, we can have many different discussions about cleavages because cleavages exist in all countries and all populations, regardless of if there is an occupation, occupation or not. So I really do want to get back to those cleavages. Uh, uh, obviously, keenly aware of the fact that the occupation looms large on any discussion on those cleavages. But there's uh, Hamas and PLO, or Hamas and Fatah, to be more correct. Uh, what do they have? I mean, what do they have to offer uh, and if Mohammed's uh, analysis is correct, that they would prefer the status quo, is the status quo tenable? And I'm saying that painfully aware that there are many, many countries in the Middle East where the situ situation is considered insufferable, and therefore everyone more out of desperation and hope than analysis say, this cannot go on, and then it still goes on. Well, I would start by saying that <clears throat> The Palestinians have had sort of two successful rounds of elections before, one in 1996 and the other ones in 2005 and, and 06. And they have been reasonably successful, at least, probably even very successful in some, in some respect, especially in 2006. I mean, it was amazing that it was one of the first times ever in, in the Arab world that we, see, that we saw a peaceful turnover um, and also, if we go back to this time, uh, 15 years ago, <clears throat> it's very important to keep in mind that the Palestinian society was considered by Freedom House and VDEM and this democracy ranking projects to be among sort of the freest societies of all uh, in the Arab world. Now, keep in mind that it's very difficult to sort of to measure democracy under occupation. It's a you know, methodological problem. But, and also, if we look at, uh, at Israel, Israel, 15 years ago was by far considered to be the only liberal democracy in the Middle East. And again, keep in mind, difficult to measure occupying societies as well. Uh, uh, but over the past 15 years, what we have seen here in this conflict, both in the Palestinian society and in the Israeli society is an authoritarian turn, which I think has gotten you know, insufficient recognition in the academic literature. That is why I, sort of, I have it as a mini project right now to look at all these data points from both the Palestinian and the Israeli uh, society. But this has consequences, of course. And Gaza is falling like a rock in these indexes. It's among the most authoritarian societies in the world now. Uh, and the West Bank is also in, 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 in free fall. And, and Israel too. Uh, Israel, I mean, Tunisia is today ranked better than Israel in VJ. Uh, and Israel is one of sort of one of the liberal democracies that has lost most on Freedom House's scores. So this is a big story, I think, to unpack the, the, uh, the authoritarian turn of this conflict. And, I mean, and one can, of course, ask, does, will, does this make sort of a, a peaceful resolution easier or harder to achieve? And I don't know that, but I can see that sort of the space for activists, for NGOs are shrinking in all of these three societies. It's most restricted, of course, in Gaza, where you know, people are arrested just for talking with Israel or Israelis. Uh, so I think this is a, this is a huge issue. Uh, uh, and, and of course, from a European perspective, and I'm not talking for myself now, but <clears throat> the European Union as an organization, they of course welcome uh, uh, new Palestinian free, fair and inclusive uh, elections. Uh, they want them to happen. You know? The big question is of course, what will happen the day after, depending on the result, will we be, you know, be back at a scenario that we had in 2006 when the uh, when third parties, especially the EU, were sort of pushing the Palestinians to have elections, and they did, and, and then sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, we had all this mess with the quarters, uh, three uh, demands on Hamas and uh, all of this, which of course led to the non-contact policy vis-a-vis -vis Hamas. 
uh, and and this is in place even today and to be i mean the truth is that many europeans official they don't really know what is going on here especially not sort of what hamas what their positions are vis-a-vis -vis a new palestinian selection because it seems that they have soured a bit now after biden won uh, before that, everybody believed that it would take place, and now it's not that not so sure anymore. Uh, but we from Europe, we have a hard time getting information out of Gaza. So we, many people don't really know exactly where sort of the prospects for elections, where they really stand at the moment. Very good. Um, I want to insist on going back to talk about the cleavages. Um, as pointed out by several people now, we're not talking about a cleavage that is about people in the sense of being two peoples. It's a cleavage that is partly institutional and administrational and administrative and so on. But even with that in mind, how are the two territories developing? I mean, to what extent is there development? And to what extent does the lack thereof or whatever development there is helping or not helping these two organizations in their quest for maintaining power. Who wants to pick up on that? Yara? Yeah, sure. Um, I do think though, before I talk about those, um, I want to make something clear. Rosa, you, meant, you said that uh, you said a term that I've never heard before, semi-occupied territories. I think it's very, important that we're clear. They're not semi-occupied, they are occupied, the West Bank and Gaza, despite the fact that there are supposed pockets of Palestinian autonomy. Everything that comes in and goes out of those pockets is controlled by Israel. When the PA president, Mahmoud Abbas, wants to leave Ramallah, he has to get Israeli permission to do so. Now, the Palestinian economy in both those territories, which I'll talk about a bit more shortly, is completely occupied. It's an occupied economy. So we have to be very careful um, particularly as international law parameters state very clearly that these territories are occupied territories. And when we slip and when we start introducing new terms such as semi-occupied, then we move into disputed, which is, you know, Israeli, um, Israeli regime language. You know, these territories do not belong to the Palestinians at all. They're not occupied. They are uh, disputed territories. So we have to be very clear. These are territories, Palestinian land under occupation, whether or not there are pockets of autonomy. Um, now, with regards to the sort of the, the development question, there is brilliant work done on, on the de-development of Palestine by Sarah Broy that I really would encourage everyone to look into. But what she spells out really is this process of constant de-development in both the West Bank and Gaza. And I think that's certainly the case. And I'm sure Mohammed can talk more about Gaza, but in the West Bank, you know, we, um, you know, the Palestinian economy is, the, it, well, in both territories, the Palestinian economy is, is an occupied economy. Um, uh, it, it does not have economic independence. And a lot of this goes back to the 1994 Paris Protocol, which was particularly damaging. It imposed this unequal customs union, which granted Israeli you know, businesses direct access to the Palestinian market, but restricted Palestinian goods entering into the Israeli one. It gave the Israeli state control over tax collection, and it entrenched the use of Israeli currency, the shekel in the occupied territories. We don't have our own uh, currency. Um, uh, and this meant that the, 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 the Palestinian authorities no means to, to impose fiscal control or adopt macroeconomic policies, which means that in effect, Israel has full and direct uh, control over the levers of the Palestinian economy. And as you can imagine, um, this, this severely limits what Palestinians can do and how they can become self-sufficient and dependent. Can they? They can't in this kind of situation. So there is a certain ceiling that, that Palestinians cannot go beyond. Um, I think the, the fact that during the pandemic, we saw this really highlighted very well, the fact that the uh, imports, medical imports were restricted very, very severely and a very minimal amount of supplies were allowed into both the West Bank and Gaza and Israel was praised um, for allowing those internationally do donated supplies um, to those territories. So I think, you know, when we are talking about development, that economic aspect has to be highlighted, that this is an occupied economy. Mohamed, would you like to briefly address Gaza? Sure. I, I think in terms of development in Gaza, unfortunately, if you look at the broader picture, not the, the 
different individual nuances because a lot of people are doing a great work. But the broader picture gives a very despairing image. The development and aid in, in general in Gaza is concentrated on counterinsurgency rather than improvement. It's concentrated on maintaining the situation as it is. The status quo, the, the very unlivable status quo. So every time there is an escalation between Gaza and Israel or war, donors jump in after each war to reconstruct Gaza to the way it was before, um, deliberately and purposefully, or maybe inadvertent, inadvertently neglecting that the unlivable circumstances is what led to that escalation in the first place. It didn't occur out of ideological motives. And in that sense, you can see it more or most clearly in the example of the Qatari aid to Gaza since 2019, where Hamas and Israel developed a clear transactional relationship that's, uh, that perhaps is more solid than the one with the Palestinian Authority because you, it doesn't have any political dimensions in it, not any, there is no political price involved. It's just purely transactional, uh, calm and quiet provided in return for Israel allowing Qatari cash to flood in. And Netanyahu was very clear about that, is that um, the money for Hamas is part of a strategy to keep Palestinians divided. That was the headline quoting him directly. In another article in Israel Hayom in 2019, Netanyahu says that um, the option of going into Gaza to uproot Hamas from power is not on his agenda whatsoever because that would give Gaza back to Abu Mazen. And he says that the, the connection between the West Bank and Gaza has been severed. They are not connected anymore. It would be a mistake to allow them to be under one authority very clearly and straightforwardly. So in that sense, this transaction relationship and this uh, aid for counterinsurgency, the immediate impact of this specification is creating an addiction that uh, it keeps life going to a very minimal extent, bare life. But as soon as it stops or decreases, you see uh, potentials for violent escalations erupting immediately afterwards to bring back the aid again. The other implication of it is hollowing the younger generation entirely out of any hope, um, just uh, perpetuating a situation of futurelessness where the, the immediate options for young Gazans is either to leave to a world that is increasingly hostile towards immigrants or to stay and try to resist violently or nonviolently. But we've seen that both cases are crushed by Israel most recently in the Great Return March where um, just shooting people as a herd of ducks in the open, uh, around 30,000 people wounded didn't move the international community's conscience. And the third option that is, that is evolving recently is to take one's own life, to commit suicide. And in a deeply conservative and religious and devout society with long heritage, long national culture of steadfastness and smooth, uh, the number of people that attempt suicide every year is an indication that people who believe that suicide is a gateway to eternity in hell still prefer hell over what has become of the Gaza Strip. And then an issue about the author authoritarian downfall of Gaza. If you look at the policing apparatus of Hamas in Gaza, uh, there are two significant issues to uh, make clear about it. The first one is that uh, to a large extent, it's cloned from Israeli practices. If you look at the Amnit Dahli, the internal security, it was found it's a clone of this really Shen bit, interrogating people to thwart uh, unrest, to thwart uh, um, espionage, etc. And it was founded by Tawfiq Abu Naim, who was imprisoned uh, by Israel for decades. The other dimension to this authoritarian downfall is that it's completely contextualized and justified by the existence of the occupation, by the existence of Israel's blockade. Because when Hamas arrests people constantly, it's on the ground of combating collaborators with Israel. And there are precedents of Israel exactly giving Hamas fuel to this pretext. If you look, for instance, at 
uh, the poach operation in 2019, it wasn't given a name, but it, uh, Hamas senior Qassam commander was killed Noor Barak in that operation. The Israeli team got into Gaza under the guise of a medical humanitarian crew. They toured around the Gaza Strip until uh, they engaged in a fire exchange with Hamas. So it fuels Hamas's uh, security concerns or let's say paranoia that Israel is constantly trying to infiltrate Gaza. It's constantly trying to recruit collaborators and it's constantly trying to undermine its rule uh, to a great extent. And that makes that gives Hamas pretext to persecute or to interrogate people who might represent any sort of challenge to its authority, because any protest that's not organized by Hamas or co-opted by Hamas is liable to being infiltrated by Israel. And that's in terms of the authoritarian downfall. Okay, thank you. Um, let's, we've been talking about aid and the fact that Biden administration is interpreted, it hasn't come into power yet, but the Biden, the coming Biden administration will probably ease the pressure to some degree, uh, at least not have the same kind of active aggression vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Palestinians in the way that the Trump administration has done. Uh, and that would maybe open up the flow of some of the aid again towards Palestine, which in turn would make the status quo manageable for Hamas and Fatah in their respective territories that they control. But Anders, since you've studied the EU in particular, and the EU is the most important donor uh, to the Palestinians, to what extent is the EU going to rethink any of what it is doing vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, irrespective in a sense of Biden coming? Or let me phrase it like this. Trump during the last four years have done a lot of things in the Middle East, a lot of things, some of which are probably going to be almost impossible to undo. So it's not just that because Biden comes, then everything goes back to how things were in 2016, anywhere, least of all here. So the question is, is the EU interested, willing, or able to kind of rethink anything of what itself does in order to change the situation that Trump has created and that we have all, in a sense, inherited? Well, uh, I mean, <clears throat> the whole issue of European aid to the Palestinians is a huge issue with sort of many, there are many things to unpack here. And if there are young students listening on, uh, onto this, this is a great topic to, to write essays about. I can also say that Al Shabaka, the organization that Yara is working for, they have a super good researcher, Al Atatir, who is a close friend of mine, who is sort of the leading name when it comes to all this. But to, to make you know, a long argument short, one can say that. The, the EU has, <clears throat> has supported the Palestinians heavily since the peace process began, with around 50% of all the aid coming in to the, to, the, to the Palestinians. That would be around 20 billion euros, between 15 and 20 billion uh, euros since 1993. And then the aid to UNRWA goes back to 1971. Uh, but what all this makes, of course, so the basic argument here is that the EU is part of the conflict. The EU is part of upholding all this, the Paris Protocol, the structures, whatever you think about them, the EU is a part of the conflict. Now, the rationale behind all this was that the EU would support the Palestinian institution building to prepare the Palestinians for statehood. And that process sort of culminated around 2010 when all the leading organizations said that the PA in the West Bank, that they are ready for statehood. Now, the Palestinian state did not emerge at the UN the year after and the year after that again. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of troubling and complicating factors such as the split and the Hamas role and, 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 and all of this. Uh, but I think the key argument is that the EU is part of the conflict here. And it's very easy to sit here on a Zoom seminar and say, you know, cut the funding and do this and that and blah, 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 blah. It's a huge apparatus. Uh, and, and I cannot see in the short perspective, any change to that. And it's important as well to keep in mind here that if there is one lesson to be learned from the Middle East over the past 20 years, it is the enormous costs of the destruction of state institutions in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, 
elsewhere. And so in light of that, it is clear that, I mean, I, I, I don't see anyone on the, on the horizon who wants to collapse Hamas governing structures in Gaza, and even less so of the Palestinian authorities uh, in, 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 in the West Bank. So, so that of course means that the aid is also sort of a way to buy security and protection and, and to upholding the status quo, how unfavorable, you know, even how unfavorable it is to the past. It's a way to uphold all of these structures because there is a fear in the EU that the alternative may be uh, worse. A final point to add here is that, as I said, it's a huge issue and there are sort of many, many people, everybody is critical to this, to be, to be honest. For, for a long, long time, we saw a lot of pro-Israeli activists being critical, and they said that they went to terrorism and all these kind of things. Uh, and, and now we see a, more and more Palestinian activists as well being critical of the aid. And those people who are supporting it are also the people in office. Uh, so it is, as I said, uh, a, a huge issue. I think I would, uh, there would have been sort of more rethinking had Donald Trump won a second term. Uh, and now I think it's, we are sort of back to uh, not, you know, doing too much reading, or at least sort of give Biden a chance. So I, I don't see any big uh, changes in the in the short perspective. I can't hear you. But, yeah, but I mean, in a sense, I mean, that begs the subsequent question, which is the looming large question that in a sense is is independent of Trump, which is that the US policy or the policy that the EU followed in any case, were not policies that in any way could counterbalance the facts that Israel create on the ground consistently and continuously. So we are on, on a slippery slope, if you will. It's just a question of how slippery it was. It got more slippery with Trump, but it's not not slippery just because Biden becomes president. Now, we've got one question from the audience which kind of fits very well in now, and that is that with these asymmetric power relations in mind, both between Israel and Palestine, but also within uh, Palestine itself, um, what, what ways forward, what avenues forward do you see? What can be done, both vis-a-vis -vis the occupation, but also in terms of internal reform, if you will, to change the way governance is done within Palestinian society? Marva, I'm going to throw you this light question. And I'm happy to take it. Um, I think it's a, it's a, everything has been discussed so far leads us very nicely to this uh, question or to the conclusion that the Oslo paradigm has reached a dead end. And everything that could be done from this point on is only to try maintain this dead corpse, hoping that that somehow uh, keeping it on, on, on breathing machines, that is the Palestinian Authority. So whether the aid flows back to what it used to be uh, before Trump, the Trump administration or uh, becomes more, that's regardless of that fact, the Palestinian Authority has uh, is undemocratic, it's unrepresentative and has lost its legitimacy. It's the same for, it's the same for Hamas. And I think, it is a moment for us Palestinians to, to really stop at this point in time and self-reflect on where we need to go next. I don't think it's a, it's a matter of reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah, because one thing I wanted to mention earlier, um, and I forgot, is that because of the Oslo paradigm, we have a Palestinian authority, or let's say a group of political elite that is divorced from the reality of Palestinians, is divorced from the Palestinian national movement that was spearheaded by the PLO once and, sub, and uh, moved aside when the PA came into power or was established. Um, and we have now this political elite is only interested in staying in power. And that's why you have Fatah and Hamas uh, fighting constantly because the interest is not how to represent the Palestinian people and their interests their main goal is to stay in power and therefore they're ready to make one concession after, after the other, not being able to accept that the regional geopolitical realities are completely different, to accept that um, they can't just simply maintain the status quo and they need to, and again, you know, the, the whole thing about um, 
the, the constant statements coming from Fatah and Hamas and different political factions about the need for reconciliations and that they're very close to reach an agreement or we are going to hold a parliamentary and uh, like general and presidential election. Those are all the political theatrics because the question is if we hold elections tomorrow, will we as Palestinians have new faces in the leadership? The simple answer is no, it will be, the, the elections will be a mechanism to have a, a, some sort of a, a legitimacy rubber stamp on the same faces we've had before, on the same politicians or, or Palestinian leaders we've had. And that had led us to the current situation. So what, what we probably departing um, from, from this reality is that we need to think about building or rebuilding our national movement and reclaiming the, the Palestinian Liberation Organization as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Again, bringing in the Palestinian refugees in refugee camps around the world and Palestinian uh, communities living in the diaspora to, to also have a say in, uh, in our political program, which again, we as Palestinians need to, uh, to think and, and configure giving um, all the, the political context uh, or circumstances we, we, are, we are in. And one point I, I want to mention building on Anders and how the, the continuous uh, or the foreign aid has led into the securitization and consequently the authoritarian trend of the PA and Hamas is that over the years or over the decades, the security uh, the, the security agencies of the Palestinian Authority has been the number one priority for the EU and the, and the US agenda. And we've had this EO, uh, Paul Cops program in the West Bank, um, constant training and, ref, uh, and, and reforms of the Palestinian security forces and um, sending gears and trainings and counter counterinsurgency trainings and so on. The same equipment we now see on the streets when Palestinians go on streets to, to protest in a nonviolent way. Um, and so if that is very important to highlight because if the status quo continues with having the Palestinian Authority, continuing the, the foreign aid and hoping that somehow um, the, the internally Palestinians will take a different turn that's uh, somehow like uh, wishing for a miracle to happen in my opinion. They, they, I don't know how, it's not an easy question to ask, you know, how can Palestinians rethink and reinvent their national movement? Um, that's upon us, I think, as Palestinians, whether we are, I mean, Palestinian politicians or pal independent Palestinian thinkers uh, to come together and, and um, and configure a way uh, ahead. But um, to recognize first that the Oslo paradigm has absolutely failed and we can't accept it to continue is a first step, I think. Thank you. I mean, a uh, very good point. And I mean, in a sense, the Oslo process is one of those examples in international politics where we need zombies. They are basically zombies. They're, they're actually dead, but they are needed to be considered alive for practical purposes, because people don't want to face what they otherwise would have to deal with. But I want to delve a bit into this. You're saying rebuild a national movement. Fair enough. But as we also know from any other kind of struggle of this kind, um, the notion of a national movement also blankets or tries and homogenize uh, people and their opinions and their attitudes uh, which vary on different issues and even on the same issue. So let me ask this question then, going back to the discussion of Gaza, West Bank, etc. Um, is there, like there is in many other countries in the Middle East, first of all, a legitimacy uh, deficit that you've been addressing, all of you have been discussing, but for instance, is there also a generational difference? as in different generations having different formative experiences and therefore are willing to countenance different scenarios going ahead. Some might, for instance, prefer what is just because it's something they know. Uh, or, And this, of course, brings us to the other big question. Well, if it's going to be something different and the peace process in the Oslo shape is dead, uh, are we talking about still a two-state solution? 
or are we talking about the binational state, the one state solution? Are those things also on the political horizon? And is the difference in support or credibility given to these different suggestions uh, based on differences in generation, for instance, or something else? Why don't you, Marva, run with it a bit and then I'll let everyone else in as well. Yeah, of course. Um... Yeah, I think, and that's my personal opinion, that every society has generational uh, divides, has a ideological divide and, and class divides, and, and that's just a matter of fact. And I don't think Palestinians are unique um, or, you know, also or even isolated from global trends of, of political polarization. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it, that's a, a phenomenon that is happening in Europe and across the globe in the US and, and elsewhere. So do I think, for example, that generational divide or uh, class divide is an obstacle to Palestinians um, rebuilding their national movement? The answer, I think, is no, because we do have examples in our history where Palestinians have indeed built successfully um, a collective, a form of a collective body, whether it be um, in the first intifada where Palestinians have organized on grassroots level um, and have had uh, some sort of a, a political unity, even though back then there was different uh, Palestinian factions uh, uh, Fatah and different leftist parties um, and Hamas uh, then was created. Um, and then again, there was the history of the, the PLO and how it was created and how it managed to um, in, not invent, not invent, but how it managed to bring Palestinians together who were dispersed after 1948 and, uh, and then later in 1967. So it's not mission impossible. Even if we uh, back then there were also generational divides, and and I, I would believe that the circumstances uh, in the 60s and uh, in later on in the 80s were much more difficult. Again, I think the obstacle here is who are the political actors that are not interested in changing the status quo. And there are, I think we have identified a couple. It's the international community, and it's definitely the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. None of those actors are interested in um, admitting the failure and giving way to new Palestinians or new Palestinian forces and leaders to emerge. So, and, and that's the obstacle, right? So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation where, let's say, in the West Bank, um, given how authoritarian the Palestinian Authority have become, has become and is not interested in any critique of its policies, it's not interested in entertaining uh, or having a fertile ground, ground for grassroots movement to develop and maybe new Palestinian leaders emerging, um, and therefore it's the same vicious cycle. We don't have new Palestinian leaders to um, to assume power or to take on the task of uh, being in charge and, and leading a, a new movement. So that is the main obstacle and, and not the, the, the different, you know, ideological um, and generational uh, different fault lines. Thank you. Yara, would you like to chip in on this? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a common question, the, the one about generational divides, and I think it's a fair question because you know, Palestine is a society that also, you know, goes through trends like anywhere else in the world. But I think it, we have to complicate it a bit more, you know. I think, yes, there are generational divides, but there are also class divides, and there is also a gender divide, and there are also secular and religious divides. And I think, you know, Palestine, like any other society, is a complicated society. And there is a tendency, especially among the sort of aid and development and diplomatic spheres here in Palestine to really focus on that generational divide and talk about uh, Palestinian youth as the ones who will who will change who will lead the way and and whilst I think there will be you know Palestinian uh, youth will be part of change I also don't want to dismiss generations before us who've gone through experiences that we have you know, never gone through. What about, you know, older Palestinian women? Why can't they be 
part of that radical change. Um, and also there is a danger where thinking that just new faces are, is change. Actually, a lot of the new faces on the scene in Palestinian politics are the sons and daughters of the corrupt politicians that we have seen for many decades. So is that really change or is it a continuation? Um, so for me, it's not about any, you know, any young Palestinian is a good Palestinian or will have good politics. I think we have to be super critical and, and, and have a more sort of nuanced analysis. And I think in terms of a national movement, it, when we talk about a sort of revived or, or renewed Palestinian national movement, we have to think about one that is built on consensus, um, not necessarily uh, unity or conformity, but one that's built on consensus that includes pol uh, political plurality because Palestinian uh, society is a politically plural society and that has to be accepted. Um, now, whilst consensus does exist on I think consensus does exist on key issues in Palestine, and I think it's always overlooked. Um, we have, you know, many examples of that throughout Palestinian history, but the consensus surrounding the end of military occupation and siege in the West Bank and Gaza, the right to return for refugees and exile, equal rights to the Palestinian citizens of Israel, that exists, um, that exists and is agreed upon by the majority of Palestinian civil society, and I think that is an important um, an important point to make. Um, but unfortunately, plurality doesn't exist. Um, and there are several reasons we touched upon it earlier. But an important point to note here is that all Palestinian political parties under Israeli military law are deemed illegal. A meeting of 10 people or more that it takes on any kind of political character is deemed illegal. Um, the EU itself uh, uh, regards all Palestinian political parties except for Fatah illegal. So we have a situation which uh, everything is contributing to a one-party system, um, both in the West Bank and, uh, and in Gaza. Uh, and so plurality is not only, an, it's not a, 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 an issue of Palestinian culture, it's not that we don't have plurality in our culture, we are a diverse people ideologically um, uh, and socially. Uh, but this culture of a one-party system has been propped up not only by the authorities themselves, but by international actors and by Israel, and it is encouraged. Currently, as we speak, there are thousands of young Palestinians, leftists, in Israeli jails, incarcerated and tortured. Uh, and one woman was released uh, yesterday, a 22-year-old uh, leftist political activist, after 15 months of torture and incarceration. So thinking about change in this kind of environment is and political mobilization is incredibly difficult it's so um it's never been harder to envision that kind of change and, and that's why we also have to think about external pressure and international pressure uh, and the big word on sort of the big elephant in the room of course is sanctions um as much as palestinians you know fight to make internal changes and um, political changes and make room for each other um, there has, it has to come with international sanctions uh, on the state of Israel. Okay, um, but I mean, I agree with you. I mean, obviously, whatever country or society you look at, you have to do an intersection analysis. So it's not just, you know, privileging one kind of cleavage or perceived cleavage over another. And it's a kind of a perpetual idea that young people are more enlightened or in some ways less stuck. But I mean, if you look at Israel, for instance, and probably Pal Palestine as well, you could say that the younger generations have even less, at least in Israel, have even less experience of people from the other side than older generations. Not saying that things were better then, but it meant that they at least have an interaction with people from the other side. So young people in and of themselves obviously is not a solution, but the question is whether they are willing to question and think in uh, trajectories that the older generations don't see anymore, or in a sense are blind to. That would be one way of looking at that. But so let's take this discussion, which is uh, showing how difficult things are and how difficult the conditions are, both internally and in terms of who from the outside is willing to contemplate or help. What about the diaspora? What about the people who are outside the two territories that we are discussing? Uh, to what extent and how are they able to help? Can they act as and create a space for some of the things that are very difficult, if not impossible to do 
inside these territories. Mohammed. Thank you. I, I think in terms of generational divides, in Gaza in specific, there is less of a divide and more of a harmonious atmosphere. If you look at the Great Return March, during the, the demonstrations, there was a common leadership a high committee that included representatives from all different backgrounds in Palestinian society, including Fatah, Hamas, uh, and literally all parties. It, there was also welcome participation of civil society. People at the front lines of the Great Return March were not asking each other whether you're Hamas or Fatah. And these divides in Gaza are diminishing uh, increasingly, especially amongst young people. There is less of, a, let's say, holding on chauvinistically to your political party. It, that is decreasing amongst younger people. So you can see people who are uh, partisans of Hamas who would have some positions that favor other parties or are critical of Hamas itself and its leadership. The divide, however, is amongst the leadership within each camp. So with Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, it's not a, a homogeneous group. Each is very divided and heterogeneous. Uh, Khaled Mishal is different from Ismail Haniyeh, is different from Saleh Haruri, and the same applies to Fatah. And in terms of, the, you can see it as pragmatists, hardliners, and moderates to simplify it a little bit and categorize it. So in the, in the last round of unity talks between both sides, Saleh Aruri, who's seen often as a, an extreme hardliner, emerged as the most uh, protagonist and advocate of Palestinian elections. There was a leaked conversation with fellow Hamas leaders in which he says that without elections, you cannot achieve anything, whether an intifada, uh, unity, reconciliation, any of these things. Elections is an obligatory passage point towards any uh, ideas or proposals that Palestinians would have. It would re-energize and reconnect the, the public with the leadership. And in that sense, I would say that with elections, there are so many risks of the same faces re-emerging re into authority again, but there are uh, numerous opportunities. For instance, the next elections have been agreed upon amongst all parties to be proportional representation system, which means that no party would have a clear majority in parliament, which would give them room to collaborate and bridge with, uh, the gap between each other to form a government rather than one party holding monopoly. In 2006, Hamas, they won about 45% of the popular vote, but they got 57% of the parliament because of the electoral system back then. That's not happening next time. The other issue is that the current leadership, whether in Hamas or Fatah, when you talk to them about elections, you can sense the fear and concern that they will not be able to amass support even from their own constituents, even from their own popular base, as they failed them time and again. And that's an issue in, that became clear in the 2016 Palestinian municipal elections, as back then Hamas did not run on a Hamas slate. They formed a slate of academics and uh, technocrats that were somewhat sympathetic to the movement, but not part of it at all. And that is a likely scenario in any future elections that Hamas would support an independent state of technocrats and academics. So that's an opportunity. I think moving forward, there is the issue that you suggested about diaspora. There is the other issue about aid. To be clear, any diminishing of the aid flow as it is would just lead to disaster. It's more or less a mechanical ventilation system to keep the population alive, but in a coma. But if you take that away, what kicks in is violence and escalation and tensions in, in the West Bank in the form of lone wolf attacks in Gaza in the, form, in the form of war, because people would not have anything to lose anymore. What is needed is structural reform in the way that aid is uh, sent and given to in the, Palestinian authority, in the Palestinian territories. The international donor community needs not to abide and play by Israel's rules. So in a recent uh, comment by the current defense minister, 
the Benny Gantz, he says, quote, the conditions in Gaza are unnecessarily poor. And I would like to see economic development and conditions improve. And then he says that this is this would be conditioned on Hamas providing calm and returning the bodies and uh, of Israelis held captive and Israeli, Israeli civilians held captive in Gaza. It's a very clear case of a hostage negotiation that he's keeping Gaza hostage, any development in it hostage, and contingent on Hamas uh, fulfilling political uh, conditions and prerequisites. So in terms of aid, the international community needs to play by their own rules, not by Israel's, not to follow Benny Gantz's recommendation that no genuine development should happen unless, and let's just keep all the, the aid focused on containing the situation. The other thing in terms of diaspora and the national movement is that the international community here is of paramount importance in terms of incentivizing or disincentivizing it. You can see that with the BDS movement, criminalizing it increasingly in one uh, European country after the other. And with any Palestinian national movement, it becomes a question of whether the international community or the European Union would uh, approve it and endorse it, or would they walk away and boycott it if it includes representatives of different political backgrounds in the Palestinian political system? The best approach to the Israeli Palestinian conflict comes from Switzerland. Their foreign policy approach is impartial neutrality, that they do not boycott or endorse any party in the conflict, but rather they engage with all parties, including Hamas. And that has that leads to significant outcomes. I remember in 2006, with the last elections, Hamas made a gamble, the moderate current and Hamas made a gamble that halting all suicidal attacks or bombings in Israel would improve their standing in the international community. They ran through the elections based on a request from the Bush administration that was uh, conveyed through Qatar. And once they ran, there were meetings between Hamas and uh, Swiss and even European officials and figures close to official governments. There were two Hamas leaders that were even allowed to visit the UK, the United Kingdom. Uh, an exception was made by Tony Blair's government. Tony Blair himself uh, decided on it. It was Ahmad Youssef and Sayyid Abu Mesmeh. And once they went there, they met with people from Northern Ireland to see how their struggle fared out and how laid out with the Good Friday Agreement. They met with separatists and unionists. And Ahmad Youssef says that this has been an extremely enlightening experience and empowering for the moderate current to argue that this is a similar experience to other hours in terms of armed resistance, and we can do this and that. They consequently developed, uh, Ahmad Youssef and the Swiss government developed an agreement or an initiative based on uh, trust building between Israel and the Palestinians a ceasefire to 10 years that would be conditioned on Israel gradually withdrawing and expanding the freedoms and rights for Palestinians in return for seizing hostilities by both sides. But it didn't get any attention by the European Union or by the US indeed. And that, that issue of the European Union choosing their own partners of uh, conferring legitimacy on one actor and withholding it from another is a major factor in that plays into dividing a Palestinian national movement or the potential for forming one. So it's essential to first look into the international community's stance on different Palestinian actors to avoid this system of guilt by association, that if a platform has someone who knows someone that's a bad guy, then we boycott the entire platform. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two more things I want to briefly have some kind of response from everyone, or at least some of you. One of them uh, is, of course, we've been discussing different kind of cleavages and uh, the perspectives that people have, what kind of political horizons and expectations do they have. So if there was a new national movement, for instance, let's say as a hypothetical for a moment, um, what would be the aim? The, uh, getting out of the occupation is one, Thing, obviously, uh, but are is the two-state solution still on the table as a political project for the Palestinian polity? That would be one question. And the other question deals with authoritarianism. Um, 
as we know from many countries in the Middle East, Middle East uh, authoritarianism tends to be much more resilient than people are willing to contemplate for obvious reasons. Um, and in the case of uh, authoritarianism, we're also talking about succession. That is, how do you reproduce an authoritarian pattern? How do you make sure that you cling on to power? And in the case of Fatah, and in general, the PA, you have the added, if you will, plot twist of the fact that because this is an entity that is so dependent on aid, and so many countries in the region and outside of the region want to meddle and participate, whatever you want to phrase it as, you're, for instance, also talking about what's happening between Saudi Arabia, UNE, and, and Israel as a potential added layer of a succession for Mahmoud Abbas with Dahlan maybe being brought in again and so on. To what extent is that just people uh, gossiping and playing Game of Thrones in their spare time? And to or, to or is this an actual political scenario where you can see a succession being decided from the top and where the population at large has, so to speak, very little say in the matter. So the first question is two state, one state, my national, what have you. And the second question is, if you will, a bit more real politic succession of authoritarianism being decided from top down. Anders, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Uh, well, I would first say that sort of <clears throat> as a non-Palestinian looking from the outside on this, it is clear to me that the Palestinians sort of have three broad options for strategy. <clears throat> One is sort of, you know, armed resistance. Two is negotiations. And three is non-violent. These are sort of, sort of three broad strategies. Uh, when it comes to this two-state solution, I mean, we here in Europe are sort of those people who, who, who like that solution the most. We are not naive. We know, of course, that it is in serious trouble. Uh, we, we often sort of liken the two-state solution to a person who is out swimming, realize that she or he is drowning. That's where the two-state solution is. But we also believe that the one-state solution is the drowning people saying that, oh, I cannot swim back to shore, so I'm gonna fly instead. That's how we see, or most people here see the one state solution as something unrealistic. Now we can have a debate about it and stuff like that. We also see that, that sort of the support for one state solution seems to be much stronger among Palestinian academic, intellectual, uh, think tank people, sort of the intelligentsia rather than sort of in the, the normal people, persons, especially if, if people look like, uh, if people look in, in, in pollings like uh, Khalil Shikaki's polling, which is very famous for us here in Europe, we follow that. Uh, and there, the two-state solution is polling around 40% among Palestinians. That is actually the lowest uh, support in about 10 years. But one state solution is polling around 10% in his, and I mean, you can frame it a little bit differently, but you know, so that's sort of where it stands. But the big thing here is that the people who, 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 who ticks the, the box other, you know, a, a different kind of solution outside both of these is actually the biggest, 43% of Palestinians. So that is sort of, that there is an interesting space there in the other type of solutions. I would leave it out there and I'll let, you know, my Palestinian friend take over from, from there. Okay, Marvel. Yeah, um, I think the two-state solution was a stillborn child. It was never to be realized and will never be, be because it's based on the assumption that the Palestinian territories in on the uh, side of the 1967 borders are under military occupation and that it would require Israel to withdraw the forces and then you will have borders, you'll have a Palestinian state. The only, the, 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 the problem here is that it's not only a matter of military occupation and having military forces on the ground. It's a settler colonial project that is not interested whatsoever in letting go of any inch of the land. And that explains why until today, the Netanyahu government and the, the many Israeli governments before him has continued the, the, um, the settlement project in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And that's why we have 600 
thousand uh, is Israeli Jewish settlers in living in the West Bank and in, uh, in East Jerusalem. In 2011, 2012, I was working at the British consulates in Jerusalem and I remember the narrative back then that we are running out of time for the taste for the two state solution. And I remember um, Joe Biden, when he was the US state secretary under the Obama administration, doing the shuttle diplomacy between the Palestinians, the Israelis, attempting or trying to come to a certain formulation that you know, we have this very short time window, either we achieve the two state solution, the Palestinians are ready, they have their institutions in place, you know, Palestinians can be called citizens, they can issue passports electronically, and there you have all these e-government services, we're good to go. But it completely dismissed the, the simple fact that the Israeli government has a different agenda, and it's a settler colonial agenda, which leaves us to one realistic option, if I can call it so, um, a one state, a one apartheid state that has one um, Jewish, Israeli Jewish identity to be considered the, the, the supremest power in land and the Palestinians to continue, um, continue to be subjugated to Israel's oppression, whether it be under this current constellation or a different one in the future. Um, and I mean, I don't have statistics on what Palestinians think, you know, I can't represent all the Palestinians and but I, what I can, what I can say in, in full confidence is that all Palestinians, what all Palestinians want is to have and exercise their right to self determination, and to live in full dignity and in justice and in freedom. And that's op that option, you know, under, I'm, I'm not sure if that option will actually um, be viable under the two-state two solution. And again, I don't believe that it will ever uh, materialize in that sense. Um, and on your question regarding authoritarianism, I mean, soon enough, we'll reach the 10th anniversary of um, the Arab Spring. So in December and in January. And if if we have learned any lesson from the um, tragic trajectory that the, the Arab revolutions have took is that many people in this region have unfortunately are not able to realize their aspirations that are pretty much the same across the board in, in the MANA region. Why, on the one hand, I mean, the Arab dictatorships or Arab dictators uh, before the revolution have been the longest dictators in the world. I mean, that's, in a way, it is a phenomenon. But that's not because they are so powerful. Um, they, I mean, Mubarak was removed in, if I'm correct, in, 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 a, in a matter of days, uh, and Ben Ali is the same. So it's not because they're so powerful that they can't be defeated or removed, but because they were supported through funding through uh, 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 arm deals, through security um, support by the international community, by the US administration, the consecutive ones, and also by the EU. I mean, if you look at the current situation in Egypt now, there is a, an unprecedented human rights crisis, and Sisi continues to imprison civil society activists and human rights defenders with full impunity. Same case with Saudi Arabia, they've murdered a journalist and cut him into pieces of the Istanbul consulate and MBS is still running free without any consequences. That is enabled by the fact that everyone, including Israel, who is committing human rights violations day in and day out is, is not held accountable for their crimes. So there is even, a, I would say, um, a crisis in our international law, a global structure where those violations um, are, are condemned, and you see that uh, many governments are expressing concern, but the weapon deals, the surveillance deals, the, the arms deals continue um, to proceed, business as usual. And that's the same with the Palestinian authorities. So in a way, would there be a smooth transition to power, whether we're talking about Palestine or any other Middle East country? The answer is no, but that's not because there is a, a some a sort of a problem in the polity itself. 
um, and that ecosystem, but because there is foreign power intervention, um, as you know very well, with the UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Iran, everybody has some sort of an interest, and we see these ideological uh, fault lines in many conflicts in the region, in Syria, in the Gulf crisis, in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the same scenario all over again, where those who are most powerful uh, in the region, financially and politically, get to determine to a certain extent how the um, outcomes of these political processes are. Um, I mean, I hate to take away agency from people, but unfortunately in this kind of power constellation, it's uh, people tend to, you know, and people as in the uh, people in the region um, are the weakest link here in this uh, power structure. Thank you. Okay, so very briefly now, Mohammed and Yara, you will have 60 seconds each because we have to close down. Yara, would you like to start? Yes, probably won't be 60 but I'll, seconds, but I'll try. Just with regards to two states, um, it is dead. It was made unviable by the Israeli regime, which has consistently built settlements. Um, and may I remind you all that the settlement empire began in 1967 with an Israeli Labour government. So it's actually a, a cross-party ideolo ideology to expand uh, and build settlements. Now, uh, my colleague Anders mentioned uh, sort of, I think, preemptively guest uh, support for the one state among me and my Palestinian colleagues. Um, uh, I, and perhaps did this juxtaposition with normal people as in the working classes or, or whoever in Palestinian society. Now, there is, a, there is a problem with polling. When you ask questions in polls about, do you support two states or one state? And you've had the two state framework and two state solutions shoved down your throats for decades. Um, and you, do, you have not had access to um, uh, any kind of other framework then I think it's obvious that you would pick some things that you know. Um, and so this is why I'm always very reluctant um, to really quote uh, polling, especially um, certain polling that is done in Palestine, which is very problematic. And I think we have to be critical of the polling that's done here in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, if you ask Palestinians, everyday Palestinians, do you want your fundamental rights? Um, and do you want to be able to go to the beach in Yaffa or Akka? Um, then I think you will find that most Palestinians would say yes to that. And that can only be realized in a one entity from the river to the sea. Um, and, and I think it's not a question of feasibility. Show me how the two state solution is feasible. I think it's, I think it's a farce. I think it's, um, it's insulting to Palestinian intelligence when you say that it's more feasible than, than the reality. And the reality is a one state reality. There is one sovereign that rules from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea and is imposing a, a regime of apartheid on the Palestinian people. The question is not about two states, one state. It's about what we want this already present one state reality to look like. Do we want it to be a fair and just re uh, reality for everyone that resides here? Or do we want to continue propping up and supporting uh, an apartheid regime? And I really think that has to be the question because the, the, re the realms and the boundaries of feasibility are determined by those in power. And I think once we smash those boundaries of feasibility, once we begin to radically imagine what a just future can look like, um, then, then I think we'll get somewhere else and we'll have more and more Palestinians saying, I don't want a two-state solution. It is, the two-state solution is, is not one of the working classes. It is not one that, uh, that supports the, the rights of all Palestinian people. It's, it's a foreign imposition that began in 1967 with the partition plan. Uh, and it is not a Palestinian idea. It is one that has been imposed on us and shoved down our throats for many decades. And it is one that we will refuse. Okay, thank you. I see a, a topic for, a, for a, another seminar at some point. Mohammed, please be uh, very think, brief. Yeah, yeah, very briefly. In Gaza, people are increasingly pragmatic. They don't ask questions about what they like, what feels good. They ask about what works, what would grant them the most minimal of a normal life. In that sense, if, whether it's one state, two state, three state, fried chicken, it would be up for it as long as it works. It becomes an issue of whether Israel and the U.S. would be up for it or not. And if we've increasingly realized that the two state solution is out of agenda in, in the current Israeli political landscape. Even with Trump's plan, as soon as it was unfolded, the Israeli right was panicking deeply 
because it made a symbolic mention of a Palestinian state that would be in practice non-existent. So we're panicking about how dare they make a mention of a Palestinian state. And the final point I conclude with is in terms of the authoritarian downfall, I would very confidently say that this authoritarian downfall is not an inherent feature of Palestinian structures or Palestinian politics or political parties. It's the outcome of the circumstances. The PA and other Palestinian parties are heavily populated with good-hearted, dedicated people who are trying their best to uh, go ahead with anything that would advance the struggle or improve their lives. But the, the general atmosphere is very incapacitating. And in terms of this authoritarian atmosphere, what incentivizes it is this extreme situation of stress that pushes Hamas to think that the survival of Hamas is synonymous to the survival of the Palestinian resistance. And it pushes the PA to say that the survival of the PA is synonymous with the survival of the peace process and Palestinian diplomacy and Palestinian statehood. And this extreme level of stress is what needs to be addressed in the first place to sort of tackle and change this authoritarian environment. Very good, thank you. Um, a somber topic. I'm glad that we managed to get some of it disentangled. There is more to be said and, and discussed, uh, hopefully at a future webinar that we can organize with all of you. I want to thank the panelists, Mohammed, Anders, Yara and Marwa for your participation and the audience. Uh, and I hope to see you again at some point. Thank you.